Welcome back to another video. This is the first video of a new series that we are doing and it is called Wildfire Reacts, which is basically whenever we take different different videos uh, and that videos that have been requested by you guys and we basically uh, watch them and respond and react to them. And they could be anything. Uh, it could be theological, political, social or literally just absolute uh, banter. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, we've got two cameras going, um, so we'll, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Uh, the video that we're going to be looking at uh, here and and for the next while is actually Doug Wilson and uh, his reaction videos. So it's us reacting to Doug Wilson reacting, uh, basically. So we'll take what Doug Wilson's reacting to, and we'll talk about it. But we'll also talk about Doug Wilson's. Uh, response and how he uh, entertains, engages these because uh, Doug Wilson is incredible, and we will also want to just advertise that because they produce amazing content that is super, uh, super helpful for everyone. So uh, let's just get into uh, the video and 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 see how it goes. <laughs> Things that God doesn't care about. You ready? Let's go. Your right beliefs. God doesn't care if you believe rightly. That, of course, brings up the question of whether this belief is right. Does God care? Very satire. Uh, sati There's definitely another word for that, but he's being uh, using satire. To try and uh, react to this, um, which is quite good. Whenever people are saying uh, saying their beliefs, and they are super progressive, and they are super wrong about the Bible, and they're doing so in a way that they're not humble and that they're not open to rebuke. I think this is the best way to do it. Uh, other approaches can be like super aggressive and angry and it basically doesn't accomplish anything um, because we ultimately have truth on our side. So whenever it says God, things God doesn't care about and it's your right beliefs, okay? This is a very progressive feature where it's about speaking your truth um, it's about what you believe in and giving a platform to whatever that belief is and that we're not uh, aggressive and that we're not in a position where we're like, no, that's wrong, you're wrong. Um, that's seen as being a very unloving un unloving thing. And so they don't attribute such an unloving characteristic to God. And so just as we shouldn't care about other people's beliefs, other people's beliefs, God doesn't care about other people's beliefs. But this is completely unbiblical because Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Jesus spoke truth constantly. Jesus himself was truth and truth by definition is subversive. It is divisive because it eradicates all the wrong views and brings them to light. And the Bible says in 2 John 1, and it just talks about truth the whole time. It says, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. In Ephesians 4, it talks about speaking truth in love. Over and over again, we're commanded to pursue truth. That truth is a person, Jesus. And so whenever we defend truth, we defend Jesus. And Jesus specifically commands us to be obedient to his word and only through obedience is love demonstrated. John 14 says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. So it does matter what you believe in because if you say something contrary to scripture, you're saying something contrary to truth. You're saying something something contrary to Jesus. And if you're saying something contrary and something unbiblical, that is disobedience. And disobedience is a sign, an indication of someone who is unloving as opposed to someone who loves God. So it does matter. The gender of your lover. God doesn't care about the gender of your lover, which meant that some of his expressions in Leviticus and Romans are somewhat confusing. God doesn't care about the gender of your lover. Again, for every what, for every what belief that we have, uh, there has to be a defense, there has to be a why you believe that. So is that 
True, again, both parties are speaking from a, a Christian point of view in the sense that they are saying, I am a Christian and this is what I think the Bible says. Uh, and so we uh, too must take the beliefs of whatever people say uh, no matter what the topic is and we must go to our objective standard which is the bible to find out who is correct we don't want to go off traditionalism we don't want to go off what our parents believe what other people believe and we don't want to just mindlessly and numblessly believe the things that we do so we have to think for ourselves and we have to say does god care about the gender of my lover and so that's the what and in order to evaluate the credibility or the truth in that statement Again, we have to go down and we have to look at the objective basis, the foundation, and see what the Bible says about this. And Doug Wilson says that that is not true and he gives two scriptural reference uh, references, one of which I will read now, uh, Romans 1. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. So that was Romans 1, and he also references a... a uh, Leviticus uh, passages uh, which deals with different sexual sins and different sins uh, and how they would have been stoned as punishment. Okay, so Doug Wilson uh, takes a statement uh, that is made, does God care about the gender of my lover? And he then goes, okay, let's see what God, uh, whether God does or not by looking at his word, his inspired word. And he says, boom, God does care. Here's why Romans 1 and uh, Leviticus as well as other passages and uh, just the general narrative for this reason, a man should leave his father and mother and become one with his wife. And again, that's a whole huge, uh, big topic, but that's what this gentleman is saying here, and Doug Wilson is reacting and responding. And for us, it is important to know how do we respond to claims that are made. Uh, and uh, to, to evaluate the truth, we must go to what the Bible says and what God says. Uh, and then we've pulled up those, those passages that provide some clarity on that a uh, specific one about does God care about the gender of my lover also uh, to go to the first one God doesn't care what I believe in which was the first thing that he said God didn't care about uh, if that was true then there's really no point talking about anything because God doesn't care about any belief and again that is just so falsifi so falsifiable because uh, does God care about if you believe in cannibalism if that was your belief, I believe in eating people. Uh, I think God does care about that. If I read the Bible again, does God care about people eating people? No matter how ridiculous, how stupid, let's go to the Bible and what it says. Yes, God values the sanctity of life and created us with infinite value, so much so that he died on the cross for us. And of course, so many different passages that show that statement to be absolute crap and it's the same for uh, these statements that are being uh, being made doesn't god doesn't care about your beliefs uh, again we already address that and god doesn't care about the gender of your lover god doesn't care about your church attendance which is why he said not to forsake the gathering of yourselves together again this is just take the what statement and analyze the why where does that fall uh, in the bible uh, it just shows up that it's completely wrong. And again, Doug Wilson pulls out a verse uh, in Hebrews where it talks about how we're not to forsake the assembly uh, uh, in Hebrews. Uh, so it, it's quite clear that we're not to forsake the assembly and that we are to gather and that there's even a big, bigger biblical picture that could be created to show why it is a necessity that we go to church, that we invest in that community, in that accountability, that we're under the authority of our elders and that we're at service for our deacons and that we are a family unit and that our gifts are being identified uh, and that we're being held accountable for our sin and that we're engaging in proper community. And by doing all of those things, that's just the fruit of being obedient to the command of not forsaking the assembly. So God clearly does care about that. Convert. This is why God must not have been thinking when he told us to disciple the nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all that God has commanded. God doesn't care how many people you convert. Again, 
This just doesn't align with the Bible whenever uh, Doug highlights it in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, how we are commanded to go into all nations. If God doesn't care about conversion, if God doesn't care about bringing lost people to know him in an intimate relationship, why then did he give us the commandment to go out and preach the gospel? If God doesn't care, why then does the apostles go into Acts, Judea, Samaria, and then all the ends of the earth? Why then does Paul have an evangelistic uh, motivation why does ephesians 4 talk about gifts a specific gifting role is evangelists so again it just doesn't align with the bible like most of these there i don't know i i've seen some outfits at the mall that can only be described as god forsaken about what you wear again doesn't align with scripture when god clearly cares about every single aspect of of our life because what people often do is they try and undermine the consequence of action so oh it doesn't matter what you wear because there's no consequence for action when there is significant implications and effects on what you wear and how others see that and again as christians we're called to value others more highly than ourselves uh, and that we're to love our neighbor as we love ourselves uh, but in equal measure what we wear often reflects our personality and our heart so yes it doesn't matter to an extent uh, but of course, what you wear does matter in the sense of humility and it does matter in how you conduct yourself in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. So again, we've actually done a blog on this recently just to make sure that we can clarify about what matters in the sense of what you wear and what doesn't matter in the sense of what you wear because uh, they both need to be highlighted. Yes, we don't want to be Pharisees about it, but also we want to be responsive to a command, which is actually in First Peter 3 where uh, it says the following, uh, when they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning, adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy woman who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. And uh, so it clearly talks about, in this passage, it talks about how we present ourselves and conduct ourselves uh, in what we wear and how we dress. Uh, and of course, uh, again, the governing principle for what we wear is humility. Uh, all that to say that it clearly, from scripture, it's quite clear that God does care about what we wear. God cares about what we wear and speak and think and do, because it all has to be in a manner that is worthy of the gospel and is bringing ultimate glory to him. How many times you've read the Bible? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Of course, I'm at a disadvantage because I know that because I've read the Bible. But he's just trying to highlight uh, there's a general theme in all of these uh, comments that are being made uh, about things God doesn't care about and they're just not backed up by scripture and they're clearly things that God does care about and so Doug's trying to say that it's just clear from these comments that the person hasn't read the Bible or worse has read it and is being ignorant to what to what is being said um, because it's quite clear that God does care about how much we read the Bible because the Bible is truth that's what the Bible is and we're called to follow truth and we're called to abide in truth. We're called to abide in Christ and in order to abide in Christ, we have to abide in his word and over and over again, it's commanded in Joshua 1, Deuteronomy 31 that we're called to carefully follow the terms of the commandments, that we're called to meditate on God's word, that we're called to be obedient to God's word and through our obedience to God's word is our love shown. So if you want to love god you have to be obedient and if you want to be obedient you need to know what you're being obedient to and if you want to know what you need to be obedient to you have to be reading the source which is god's word also god's word contains incredible ethics and incredible truths and wisdoms that when we read it is for our own benefit for every commandment god gives there's a fruit or there's a reason that actually affects and transforms our life for the positive well not just your church, but it should be a minimum of 
uh, another response <laughs> about how God does care about what you give, not just to the church and not just to that institution, because again, a lot of exploitation has happened where people just uh, want your money and a lot of tele- televangelists do that. So we have to be careful about who we give to. That's why it's important to be uh, plugged into a local uh, a local body that you know and go to regularly and that you're in fellowship with, community with, and you know the people and you know where your money is going to. But again, that's a whole other story. Uh, again, but Doug Wilson's actually talking about this 10% rule. Should we actually give 10%? It's taken from Malachi 3.10 where it says, bring in the full 10th uh, tied into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and again it depends on the translation denomination how that's interpreted but it is important uh, a fundamental biblical principle on giving is second corinthians 9 7 where it says each one must give as he has decided in his heart not reluctantly or under compulsion for god loves a cheerful giver and then again we're talking about like, the widow's offering how uh, she gives sacrifice so again there's no heights in how much you can give to God and again a a threshold or a starting point is this 10% rule. The 10% rule is just a starting point that is again drawn from Malachi Uh, but again we have to reconcile in our own hearts how much we should give because again depending on our own economic situation and all of that jazz uh, will determine how much we can give but it's about the conviction that God brings us under uh, should determine uh, each of us should be giving something back to God because the money that we do have is not our own Uh, and the 10% rule is just the starting point but again the ceiling there is no ceiling and we should always aspire to give as much as we can and be cheerful in our giving and be more charitable as opposed to withholding Uh, so yes God does care about what we do with our money and how we how we give it right way so Nadab, Nadab and Abihu were burned up because they worshipped in the wrong way. Care about how we worship and uh, the biblical reference again. You see the defence for every statement Doug says. He just responds with scripture. Uh, Leviticus ten. Uh, Aaron's sons Nadab and Abihu were killed by God because they were worshiping wrongly because they were not following uh, the precept commands that had been given by God uh, with reference to how they were to worship. And so uh, God killed them. So clearly God does care. Uh, and again, how we worship God, that is to worship is not praise. Worship is literally the actual living sacrifice of our bodies, offering them up to Christ. And God clearly cares about how we do that. So if we do it in obedience to him and live for Christ, that's called worship and true worship. Whereas if we live in a way and a manner unworthy of the gospel and contrary to God's word, then that is not proper worship. Uh, That is being disobedient to God and God clearly cares about that. What God does care about, you love your neighbor. That's in the Bible, but I don't don't know. uh, I don't know how much I'm to love my neighbor unless God tells me. If you speak up for the oppressed, is speaking up enough? Don't you have to do something? Your theological humility. Now I want you to look at this phrase, your theological humility, and the smugness of the expression here. How much you give to the poor? I thought God didn't care how much we give. If you judge others instead of improving yourself, Can I judge others for not improving themselves? Can I judge others for judging others? How you work to build bridges with those with different beliefs. To the left. Uh, I don't think this gentleman is interested in building bridges to the right. It's quite a good one. God clearly does care about how uh, we interact with people, both sinners and Christians. Again, Christians, there's a focus of being of one mind, of one faith, and of having unity. And then, of course, disagreement comes within the church. Uh, but that's a whole other topic about how we deal with disagreements. Uh, and of course, building bridges with people who are unsaved and have completely different views and secular views. There is a time to uh, build bridges, but there is also times where you just have to stand opposed uh, to views that are propagated that you just do not stand uh, do not stand by. And a hyperbolic example would be in Nazi Germany, whenever they were killing Jews, you couldn't stand by that. Now, that, that wouldn't have been a time to build bridges with the Nazis on those things. Uh, instead, you're just called to... Uh, say that that is erroneous and that is completely immoral and wrong and you're to stand opposed against it. That's an exaggerated example, but of course we can think of examples in our society today where we need to do the same uh, the same thing.
Uh, and let's just look at more. How you embody Jesus to others. Fair enough. That's a good one. It's fair. See, you're not opposed. Doug Wilson's not opposed to the person, just opposed to the beliefs that are being propagated. Uh, and he has just pulled them down. Uh, and we've looked at them and seen why they're wrong and contrary to scripture. But whenever you take a statement, uh, again, this is a good point. So you shouldn't just invalidate a source. So if you have a person and they say things that you disagree with, that does not then mean you should uh, say that that person is never going to say anything that's correct or true. No, instead, we should always listen and be attentive to people and what they have to say. And we should examine what people say. And what they argue and align that with scripture and see if they have any scriptural backing and in this case uh, even though this person has said a lot of 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 uh, on biblical things he says something and we can evaluate the truth such as it's important to embody christ and we can take that statement and we can go and we can look at scripture and again philippians 3 talks about how we're to be conformed into the image of christ that is jesus and how we're called to emulate emulate him and how we're called to abide in him and live as he did and can do so through the spirit that is at work within us and so we embody the same characteristics of humility and love compassion and uh, truth as jesus did so class you enjoyed it and i hope you learned something from it uh, again doug wilson's very good and has got a lot of great points but also uh, we just want to react to what he was saying and we wanted to react to the statements that were being said and to evaluate them uh, with scripture uh, and i hope to see you again on the next wildfire reacts video